Hello, hello. This is Austin Fitch from Horizon Investments, and want to welcome everybody to our uh, review of the third quarter and our outlook for the fourth quarter from the Horizon One team. Uh, really looking forward to diving into uh, the content that we have today. Uh, as usual, I've got Scott Ladner, our CIO, here with me. And he will uh, help us as we go through a lot of the items that probably are on everybody's minds in regards to the election and uh, the stimulus conversation that, that has come back to the forefront over the last couple of days. Uh, we're going to talk on the consumer. Um, obviously, we've, uh, we've done that uh, a, a decent bit over the last couple of quarters with all that, that's going on around the world and, and within market. Um, so we'll we'll make sure to touch on that, uh, and then not surprisingly, uh, we will talk about uh, the virus and, and COVID nineteen, and uh, you know what we're seeing there, and, and specifically the the impact uh, on the economy and, and and on the markets. And, and I would caveat really all of those, and, and I think everybody knows this that's on the phone. Uh, hopefully, most folks have have been here before, um, but really every. Everything we're, we're talking about today is really going to be in context or in the context of, of the market and, and what's the impact on an investment portfolio. Um, when we're looking at uh, data and, and information here internally, uh, regardless of how you feel about a certain topic, uh, we're more focused on, okay, what's the impact to, from an investment perspective? So uh, you will absolutely hear us dive into that. Uh, as we as we go through today. Um, so with that said, um, one thing I will mention uh, before we get too far in, uh, as usual, uh, don't hesitate to ask questions using the question feature there as part of the GoTo uh, webinar box uh, on your screen. We will absolutely uh, try to get to those where relevant uh, throughout the deck today. And then if we don't get to them as we're going through it, uh, we will address any remaining questions uh, at the end of the call um, as, as kind of a, a final Q&A time period. So we'd love to take those questions. Obviously, as, as everybody knows, the more interactive uh, these things are, the better. Um, but with that being said, we'll, we'll dive right in. And uh, I will bring in Mr. Ladner here uh, to really talk to us about what we're seeing from a market expectation perspective uh, around the election. Scott, what are what are we seeing? Maybe talk us through this, uh, this chart specifically, but also the impact more broadly on, on the markets as we head towards November. Uh, hey, Austin, and, and hello, everybody again. Um, so what we're looking at here is uh, are, are some prediction markets about, uh, you know, about who's going to win, whether it's the Senate or, or the presidency. And so the, the way this is set up, is the yellow line is, is, uh, is betting markets on the Senate. And so when it's going down, that's Democrats taking the Senate. Uh, and the red and green bars is the presidency. When it's red, it's, it's Biden favored. When it's green, it's Trump favored. And so, you know, I think uh, you know, today, uh, you know, this is through uh, September 30th, but, but, you know, you can um, just, just know that these things really haven't changed. Uh, and so, you know, the base case today is should probably be a, a blue wave kind of scenario where the Democrats take both the Senate and, uh, you know, and the presidency. Um, that that comes with uh, this the obvious uh, caveats that this is kind of how it looked right before the election 2016 as well, and so you know but while we shouldn't make the mistake of just saying since it looked this way last time and it turned out that Trump won, uh, we should just assume that's going to happen again. Uh, that's sort of a silly thing to do, um, but we also shouldn't take these things at completely face value and just say it's a guaranteed outcome. Uh, so you know right now the base case probably needs probably does need to be that, that Democrats take uh, both the presidency and the Senate. Although the Senate is a much closer call right now than than the uh, than it looks like the White House is, uh, in terms of market implications, um, you know there are the the, the 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 whisper number going around right now, uh, should that blue wave take place, uh, is a five trillion dollar plus stimulus package. So if you're wondering why the market's been up over the last few days, um, that is that is a not a small part of the reason, uh, because the, because people are kind of talking themselves into the idea that. Uh, with a with a democratic kind of blue wave scenario in, in, in the out in the in the election, that we're going to get an, a kind of astoundingly large uh, fiscal stimulus package, um, and that would definitely be good for markets and good for growth for the short term. Um, uh, clearly, the tax and regulatory policy of such an administration uh, would be more challenging uh, over the medium term, but uh, but the market is trading on a very short term basis right now, 
um, and, we, and that, that does appear to be uh, very consistent with market internals in terms of what's what's moving and what's not. Um, that you know that 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 massive stimulus program, given a blue wave scenario, uh, is what is being priced into markets as we speak. Scott, and I think that probably goes to we've seen some other research shops uh, on the street put out a number of different reports saying that, uh, like you said, a, a blue wave maybe isn't nearly as bad as, as maybe it was once perceived or, or believed. Would would that be consistent with with what we're seeing there from a research standpoint? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, there there are there are some pretty high profile research pieces and and, and firms out there kind of kind of banging the drum that that a a Biden win and a and a blue and a and a Democratic Senate uh, would be a good thing for risk assets. Uh, it would be and and so, you know, I think that that's that's probably not a not a horrible case to make uh, if they do look at something like a five trillion dollar stimulus package. I mean, you know, you could just don't fight against that kind of cash. You know, if you're in markets. Um, but but it, but it would be. I mean, look, there's just there's just no there's absolutely no denying the fact that uh, massively increased regulatory burdens and and massively increased taxes would be headwinds. Um, and so you know you'd, be, you'd you'd end up with a fighting match between the short term growth impulse that's that's associated with with a, with a gigantic fiscal stimulus package associated you know like against the uh, you know against against the backdrop of, of you know much higher much higher regulatory and and, and tax burdens. So it's it's, uh, it's anybody's guess as to, as to who would win that. But you know, our, our our take right now is that you probably do get a, if you probably do get a bump based on the stimulus sort of um, uh, you know based on the stimulus kind of kind of idea. Uh, but we think that probably be fairly short lived. Um, but it, it, it's really going to depend a lot on the makeup of the Senate. I mean, if you're talking 50 or 51 uh, seats, that's a very different outcome than if you're talking 52 or 53 seats. So it's there's still quite a lot, but quite a lot, but quite a lot up in the air right now. No, it absolutely makes sense and. And Scott, I know we've talked about how maybe there's some some disagreement um, just generally in regards to the the outcome uh, and the impact on the markets. I think the one thing that we have seen in terms of general consensus is that we should come to expect some some delays this year. So I, I think the conversation we've been having is maybe in 2020 you don't have election day, maybe you have election week, or maybe even election month. Uh, right, the the chart on the left for for folks that are um, that are looking at, at these two charts, the the chart on the left basically is a survey that that YouGov put out, and it says you know by when will the election actually be decided? Um, and what you see is over three fourths of of folks that, that responded to this survey don't believe that we'll know who the president is when we all go to bed on on November the third. Um, now I, I think. If you make the case that, that we do, maybe that's a, a positive surprise just from a certainty standpoint. Uh, but you do have on the right-hand side there the, that timeline for in the case of a contested election or, or there are delays, you know, what's the timeline that we're looking at? Scott, is there any specific date or, or timeline item that, that we should be paying attention to in your mind? Uh, yeah, I mean, it really is. It, it 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 probably does hinge on that first week or so. So it, it's you know, on the the next slide we can see that there we are. The way the market is pricing these things out right now, we can we can actually look at something like like VIX futures options and VIX futures contracts and figure out kind of where the where the pump and volatility is, where the hump is. Uh, you know, where is the market expecting this thing to sort of be resolved? And right now, the the, the you know, after kind of you can peel apart these things and. To, and sort of figure out that it, like there's about a two thirds the market's pricing about two thirds chance that we know the results of the election by about the middle of November, and about a what third about a what third chance that it goes longer than that, and that you know that feels about right to us. Uh, so you know we're really talking about you, most likely you, you know most likely we don't know the the results on election night, but it's not impossible, um, and, and and it's also uh, you know but but at the same time we're probably not we're talking about it maybe a week possibly two. Uh, we're not talking about something that's going to drag out into the December. We're not talking about something that's going to drag out into January. Um, that type of that type of scenario would actually be very bad for risk markets. Uh, that is the thing that the market is the most worried about is some sort of contested election that drags on and on and on. Um, so absent that, like getting getting a clear clear winner, whichever way it goes, more quickly will end up being a good thing for markets. And and Scott, just for for folks that are looking at this chart, obviously we're looking at VIX futures in October relative to November. Maybe just explain to folks this this isn't normal, right? You you don't normally see folks buying VIX futures into November for an event that's going to happen on November the third, right? Uh, 
Yeah, that's right. And and, and sort of the, the nuance and the goofiness about VIX futures is that they they you know when they settle, they're really looking a month ahead. So that so the, the October future in VIX is the one that actually contains the election. Um, and then and November future actually is basically like the back half of November and, and half of December. So, you know, if you were if you were like in normal times, you would expect that the October future, which contains the election and the, and the week or two after it, um, it would be the one that would be like high. You know, that, that's that's where the risk would be. Uh, and, and in this case, they basically push the push some of the risk out the term and they, they push it out into the into that November contract, which really covers, uh, you know, covers covers the back half of November and, and, and early December. So that's 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 where, you know, that's where we're seeing this idea that a contested election is certainly in the cards and being priced in. Uh, something that takes a month to go, uh, a month after the election to, to sort of decide it. That's this is this is how we can detect these sorts of things. No, that's that's a great point, Scott. And I, and I know we're, in talking about volatility, obviously, you know, uh, the the first quarter of this year, we all experienced volatility, and and it's fresh on everyone's mind. And and I think we would make the case that the reason that that volatility is probably as relevant today as, as it was earlier this year is unfortunately that the liquidity environment really hasn't gotten much better from what we saw in March when that liquidity environment really caused some some challenges uh, from a marketplace perspective. Yeah, th this, this, is, this is one of the vexing things over the last year or two uh, is that we've had liquidity environments uh, in futures markets that have been really pretty abysmal. Um, it has to do with with the nature of who's making markets nowadays versus a couple three years ago, and certainly certainly very different than than five, ten, fifteen, twenty years ago. Um, but but the the upshot is that when things get volatile at all, um, when things get a little bit hairy, the, the market makers just really pull back. And so what we're looking at here is a, is a picture of the the number of contracts that are on the bid or the offer for the S P five hundred futures contract, which is the most liquid equity contract in the world. And uh, you know a number like like 40 or 50 like we're seeing here and you know toward, at, during, during September um, is like 10, 20 million bucks. And so that you know that's saying if you have if you have that much that much stock to buy or sell, you're going to start moving the market. If you have more than that, that's that's kind of that's a crazy low number. Um, but what what that what that really you know what that translates into though is the is the fact that it doesn't take a whole lot of money to move markets a lot. Um, and so if you have a large order to, to go one way or the other. Um, you're going to end up moving markets a ton, and and so this this is this begets a lot of intraday volatility. It begets a lot of overnight volatility when things are even even thinner. Um, and so the, you know a, a liquidity backdrop like this is is sort of the the the, the ingredients that you need in order to get a, a, a lot of volatility, uh, a lot of really sharp moves uh, that feel kind of crazy. And those moves though we we need to take with a grain of salt because they are uh, they may not have as much information in them as as other moves would typically have. Uh, that would come with a, with a lot more volume being traded. No, that's, that's a great point, Scott. And I think maybe that, that dovetails nicely into a, a conversation around stimulus. And, and we could have easily shown, you know, the chart here, looking at the Fed's balance sheet, which we all know has has ballooned to seven trillion dollars. Um, and obviously, if there's more stimulus money, that will only increase. But I think one thing that that we do feel um, it is also something that is worth noting, not just the, the balance sheet side of things and, and the amount of money that's being kind of put into the system, but it's also the interest rate for, you know, side of things. Um, and this is a chart. If we were to look at central banks around the world and, and kind of basically create a global central bank rate. So think of the Fed funds rate in the U.S. We just basically aggregated that up globally around the world for, for central banks and, and said, okay, so what have central banks actually done from an activity standpoint over the last, call it 18, uh, 21 months now? And, and I think what you would see is you've seen a pretty dramatic cut of interest rates just globally. And obviously, we've seen that in the U.S. And, and Scott, I think we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that here in a second. But the, the fact that rates have come down so fast, really everywhere, uh, is really a, another stimulative measure that is beneficial for markets uh, in addition to the actual stimulus monies that, that have been injected into the system. Yeah, that, you know, Austin, that's right. And, and, you know, everybody knows about QE and everybody knows about the fiscal stimulus. You know, frankly, everybody knows about, about rate cuts. Um, but, but these things do take time to kind of work their way through the system. So you know, what we we entered we entered the COVID crisis with some cuts, some rate cuts globally already already sort of baked in um, that we're going to help a little bit, and obviously we, we everybody cut to zero except for China uh, in in the wake of this thing, 
Uh, and so, you know, these, this is this is going to be, uh, um, you know, stimulus measures that are in place that haven't really gotten the way to, to to work themselves fully through the system. We're gonna we're gonna take a look here in a, in a, in a minute or two about different ways this really impacts the, the, the impacts the economy and impacts and impacts systems, um, that, which I think is under underappreciated and, and, and pretty important. Um, but but it but it, you know it's it's one thing to say that the rates have come down to you know to zero pretty much across around the world, but it, it is it is very different this time with respect to how uh, you know how the Fed and other central banks are looking at, at the potential for to, to raise rates. So if we if we you know, if we go to the next slide, um, you know one of the important things and we've been talking about this for for a number of quarters now. Uh, the, the, one of the really important things that I think is very underappreciated, not very well understood, is the, the nature and the kind of what, like, what it means for the Fed to have changed the way they define inflation. And so, you know, you might have heard talk about the, the Fed moving to this average inflation targeting scheme uh, in, in their in their framework. And you know, what, and so, but you know, what does that really mean? Um, you know, here's this is this is one way we can kind of you know tease out like. What does it really mean in terms of like in, uh, impact in the way the Fed is going to react to how they see the economy evolving? So, in other words, given a certain set of, of, of circumstances or projections, how likely are they to move interest rate policy? And so, prior to this change, and you know, th in this change that just got undertaken in September formally, um, you know, they, the, the Fed puts out projections about what they, you know, what they think GDP is going to run at, employment and inflation. It's, it's basically are those things going to be running hot or cold? Relative to their long-run averages, um, and generally, or at least for the last 75 years, um, when the Fed has set, when the Fed has projected that that GDP, employment, and inflation were going to run hot relative to, or you know, run run better than uh, their their kind of their long-run averages, that would be a signal to the Fed that say, hey, we need to start raising rates because it takes a while for the rate raises to come into the system and to actually impact things. And so what we see here is, is you know, the, the prior years, 16, 17, and 18, we've had, uh, you know, the Fed has thought that GDP is going to run run high. They thought that employment's going to do pretty well. And they and then they thought their model thought that inflation is going to be equal to or higher than their target. That's pretty much where where they where they were at the, their most recent projections back in September. But prior in 16, 17, and 18, that set of inputs would lead was leading to the outputs on the right side, is leading to their outputs saying, we're gonna. You, you should expect us to hike rates. You know, and they, this is we see this through their dot plots. And so, with that same set of inputs, the output from the Fed prior to this 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 regime change was we're gonna hike rates, and you should expect it. Today, they've got the same. You know, they think GDP is gonna run hot. They think employment is gonna do do pretty well over over the medium term, and they think inflation they're gonna meet their inflation target. And they're telling you don't expect any rate hikes. So very different reaction to to the to the same set of inputs um, today than than, they, than they've had in the past, and and so that's you know that is one that's very important. The second the second important part though is, is what's on the next slide, and that is that the market you know the market believes them. So it's one thing for the Fed to come out and they say uh, you know like listen, we're not going to raise rates anytime soon because we have adopted a new definition of inflation, and that new definition of inflation takes into account the fact that we've missed on inflation for the last decade pretty much. But that's not the way they that's not the way they've, they've acted in the past. And so they had to actually convince the market that, that, you know, guys, we really mean business here and we're not going to hike rates anytime soon. And this chart right here is the best way we can depict that the market is buying what they're selling. So if you remember back after the great financial crisis, the last time the Fed took rates to zero, um, the, the blue line depicts uh, what the market expected the Fed to do over the over the next you know three months, twelve months, two years, three years, four years, five years, and so on, and and the upshot is you know after at the end of 2009, the last time the, the Fed took rates to zero, uh, the market was expecting them to begin to raise rates within a year. Uh, you know they, they they thought the Fed was going to start raising rates, um, and so if you remember you know if you were managing money back then or if you had clients back then, you probably remember all the talk about uh, managing for a rising rate environment. Like that was all the talk on the fixed income world. Like, how are you going to manage the rising rate environment? Well, that's because the market, you know, you can see very clearly here, the market expected there to be a rising rate environment. They, they expected the Fed to start hiking pretty quickly. Um, it didn't happen for a number of years, but, but, the, but the market was pricing in hikes going, you know, pretty pretty quickly after they went to zero. The orange line is, is what the market expects the Fed to, to do today. And they're not pricing in the first rate hike until the, like the next next president. I mean, it, we're talking years years before the Fed is going to get off zero. 
And I'm not here to argue about whether that's a good or a bad thing. It's like what we think about that is, is, is completely irrelevant. But what, what, it, what matters is what the Fed's going to do and, and how the market is going to react to that. And the, and the market right now is believing the Fed in, the, in, in that they're, you know, they're not going to raise rates for a long time. Um, and that is going to have like very large implications for asset prices for, and, you know, for, and, and for other things like, like corporate credits and mortgages and things like that that we're going to talk about here in a minute. But this is a really important chart. And, and the change in the Fed reaction function and the way that and the change in the way the Fed defines inflation is a really, you know, possibly the most important thing that's come out of this, uh, you know, out of this pandemic um, for the, you know, for asset prices at least over the next three to five years. Well, and, and Scott, I know we've we've talked internally that the probably some of the four of the most dangerous words in in our industry are it's different this time. But I, I think your point about the, the the Fed's change really does paint this, you know, especially as you look at a, a graph like that, like this does does paint that picture. Um, I, I think a perfect example of maybe how that's impacted markets and, and specifically in this case, the, the bond market is if we were to look at investment grade credit. Uh, so this, uh, I know we've looked at similar types of charts in the past um, on these types of calls. It's, it's, it's called a seasonality chart where we're looking at each year over a historical period and, and looking at you know some series of data. And, and what we're looking at here is, is corporate bond issuance, investment grade corporate bond issuance specifically. And, and obviously we're looking at about 10 years worth of data we could have gone much, you know, we could have gone 20, 30 years further back. It, it would have told a similar picture uh, or to a similar story in that really there's there's kind of this historical norm in terms of credit issuance throughout a given year. It's pretty steady. Uh, you can see in certain years, maybe that slope is a little bit less than other years. Uh, but what you'll also note is that light blue line that really starts to take off uh, mid-March of this year. Um, and, and I think that that couples with Scott exactly what you're talking about in terms of the expectations for that interest rate environment and, and the fact that interest rates currently uh, are really are on the floor. You've seen corporate or corporations start to issue uh, issue bonds kind of hand over fist um, and and at a historic rate that we don't necessarily think changes uh, anytime soon because of the fact that really you're getting kind of this idea of cheap money. Um, I know we've talked about, okay, what, what does that mean? What are they doing with this money? There's a number of different things that can be done, whether it's uh, stock buybacks, whether it's capital expenditures, whether you know it, it allows them to maybe refinance debt um, at, at lower rates. There are so many things that actually are beneficial from a corporation standpoint. Obviously, they may create challenges you know, a lower interest rate environment may create challenges for a retiree that's trying to generate income off a portfolio. But for a corporation that's trying to finance a business, it actually creates a, a favorable set of circumstances. And, and Scott, I know you've got a slide here that looks at just liquidity in, in corporate debt outstanding relative to GDP. Maybe walk us through this slide and, and just the, the jump that we've seen and, and what that means just more broadly for the marketplace. Yeah, so so that, you know, like like Austin said, uh, this is you know this is a just a chart showing um, the amount of corporate debt that's in, in the United States relative to the size of the economy, and and the, and the red shaded shaded areas are um, are recessions, and so probably doesn't uh, doesn't take a genius to figure out that that when the, when, when a recession hits, typically corporations pull back, um, and you know they pull back on borrowing, they pull back on leverage, uh, you know and things generally try to get smaller because uh, business conditions have worsened. Um, Look what happened this uh, this most recent one, uh, the, just a, a gigantic spike, uh, and so that that is corporations issuing debt hand over fist um, into the teeth of this recession, and you know like we 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 you know we have some some idea about why and and, and everything. I mean, people were certainly drawing down lines, uh, they were turning those things out, uh, but at the end of the day, you know the the corporate reaction to this recession was very very different than at any recession uh, over the last 50 years, and and that's and that's going to be important. Uh, when, you know, what that means is that you know, not only do corporations have a ton of cash on the balance sheet, uh, they have a ton of liquidity out there, that when this thing actually starts to turn, and, and, and it has started to turn, it'll continue to turn, when this thing gets better, um, there's, there's a lot of cash out there to do M&A, to do buybacks, to do R&D, to do CapEx. Um, you know, corporations are, are in, a, in a pretty strong fiscal situation 
um, you know, rel you know like relative to, to to how they typically have been, and partly because the Fed has taken rates to zero, and it's and it's essentially it's virtually free for corporations to borrow money out out, out five ten years, um, and treasuries have taken advantage of that. And, and Scott, I know we talk about corporations and and maybe dovetailing or, or pivoting off that a little bit is, is talking about inventories and, and manufacturing for said corporations. And, and I think we've seen a really interesting uh, spike in in that data as well that would signal to us that you're really going to start to see a product a production ramp up. Uh, maybe that has been financed in some cases by kind of that that bump in in corporate bond issuance, but but more broadly, let's let's talk about what are we seeing in this chart specifically, and and what does that mean uh, more broadly? Yeah, th th this is a chart that I, I just I, I frankly I just ripped straight from Tom Porcelli over at RBC. Um, we think he's really good. We talk to him every every we talk to him pretty frequently. Um, but but uh, you know this, this is this is this is really kind of get, getting into the weeds of the ISM data. Um, but what it is is uh, is is looking at the the ratio of, of production to inventories. And so when this number is, is is very high, that means that either production is screaming or inventories have gotten killed uh, and are very low. And in, in this case, uh, you know, it, it, we, we do know from from surveys and from other and from other people that inventories got to a really low place uh, over the last three to six months. Um, and, and and so what does that mean? Uh, that means that people were still continuing to buy like we, we've seen consumer uh, like retail behavior and, and people have continued to buy throughout this pandemic. But production really, really slowed down or even halted for a lot of places on, on the manufacturing side. And so that, that just means that, that we've had massive in, inventory drawdowns as people continue to buy, but firms have stopped to make. Um, and, and, and so that the, the upshot for that, though, is that on, when, the, when, this, when this ratio gets around this level, historically at least, it typically means that you're getting out of the, you either are out of or are getting out of the recession. Like it's about over. Because what's coming uh, as a result of this inventory drawdown is, is is a huge inventory restock, and so man, manufacturing activity in the United States over the next three to six months is going to be going at a breakneck pace to try to rebuild inventories and, and get back on you know kind of get back to normal. Um, that is going to do, do nothing but add an, an additional kind of underappreciated tailwind to this this economy right now that folks just aren't talking about. And Scott, you mentioned the, the consumer and obviously what we've seen from a retail perspective, and, and you even mentioned the idea of getting back to normal. I think. These next couple of charts that we've got really talk about the consumer specifically and really highlight the fact that uh, despite probably one of the sharpest uh, declines in, in economic activity earlier this year with the, the pandemic really shutting down 70 to 80 percent of economic activity around the globe, you've actually seen a, a fairly resilient consumer uh, whether you're looking at the, the daily reading, which is the, the call out there kind of in the middle of the page or the, the weekly reading um, from some of the survey data, you're, you're really seeing a consumer that, that actually feels pretty well uh, about their personal financial positioning. Is that, is that fair statement? Yeah, and, and again, this is one of those things that, that I don't think people quite have, quite have appreciated, I mean, like how much it matters. The, the, the consumer came into this downturn in the best shape they've pretty much ever been. Um, you know, the, 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 if you wanted a job, you had a job, you were getting pay raises. Um, you know, this this is a survey that goes back to, to the mid 80s and, and, and it asks a question, um, you know, how do you feel about your personal finances? Do you feel good about them? Um, and, and and we were at levels, you know, right before this hit, we were at all time highs. Uh, but already we've gotten back to levels that, that we, you know, that prior to this you know, previous episode, last time we saw them was, was the late 90s. Um, and think about how, you know, how your clients felt, how you felt about, about how things were going in, in, the, in the late 90s. It, you, felt, you felt pretty flush. Um, you know, the, the other reason why people have, have, have actually felt pretty good um, is that they were not deleveraging. I, I mean, they have been deleveraging over the last 10 years. You know, th this, is not, this has not been a typical expansion where, where we had a bloated consumer coming into uh, you know, kind of bloated and over leveraged consumer coming into a downturn. And, and, and that's, you know, typically the way recessions go is like you, everybody levers up too much. Um, and and they get kind of bloated, and then something something happens, and the economy turns down, and nobody's prepared for it, and they're over levered and overextended. Absolutely not the case this time. Um, you know, the, the the consumer came in this time, and with the with the best the best looking household balance sheet uh, in the in in the last 50 years. And so, you know, the way that we came into this crisis uh, is really important to understanding what the behavior is like right now. I mean, every everybody's shocked by how robust uh, retail sales have been, and how robust the consumers been, and how robust these surveys of confidence have been, 
it's part part of the reason is because yeah, it's been a shock, um, but people came into this uh, in, in in really very good shape, especially relative to how they generally come into recessions. It's just it's a it's a really large difference. No, that's a great point, Scott. And, and I mean, this chart actually maybe just paints a picture of, of how different it is uh, in, in regards to maybe the previous recession that, that we're all, um, I would say, you know, familiar with to coming out of the, the great financial crisis. And, and what you see, right, is household net worth took really almost five years to come back to where it was uh, prior to the great financial crisis following that recession. Uh, it took all of three months uh, for household net worth to hit another all-time high uh, following what we saw earlier this year. Um, and I, I think, again, that paints a picture of just how healthy the consumer is from a, a personal balance sheet standpoint. Uh, it really speaks to the confidence, obviously, of that consumer. Uh, but, Scott, one thing I think that we've noted internally is it, it's different. You know, we again, we'll say it again. It's, it's different this time, but... Um, the reason being, right, in, in 2007, 2008, uh, a lot of the net worth conversation actually had to do with the uh, the, the property values and the, the household, uh, the, the home worth or home values. Um, I think what you're seeing this time obviously is different. You didn't see that hit there. And you're actually seeing uh, what will hopefully end up being or probably end up being uh, a refi wave that is really going to drive, uh, you know, drive that consumer confidence even higher is that is that probably a fair statement there yeah you know like this this is probably probably the uh you know like one, one of the last of the of the kind of underappreciated uh tailwinds that we've got going right now but this you know what we're looking at with this chart is uh in the in the uh, in the the red line on top or the, the the orange line on top is the 10-year treasury rate and the white line on top is the is the, the basically the, the national 30-year fixed mortgage rate and there's a very tight relationship historically between these two things. The bottom chart's just the difference between those two. You can see it, it tends to be reasonably stable. Um, and, 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 and today, uh, mortgage rates are basically too high. They're way too high relative to, to where treasury rates are. And, and the, you know, the, the one, you know, so treasury rates is what are one component to what, what defines a mortgage rate. The other, the other part, of the, part of the mortgage rate is basically interest rate volatility expectations, which are on the floor. They're very, very low right now, and for, for good reason, because nobody expects the Fed to do anything for a decade. Um, and, and so the, you know, what, what, what we're, what the translation of all this is, is that more, you know, mortgage rates in the United States, 30 year mortgage rates in the United States are going to be under two and a half percent, um, within the next three to six months. And they're going to stay there for a very long time. Um, you know, it's, it's even feasible that you get a mortgage rate under 2% uh, based on volatility expectations, but regardless, um, pretty much everybody in the United States with a mortgage is going to refinance. And that is a, an unbelievably large fiscal stimulus. That does not require the government to get along. Uh, it doesn't require that that Pelosi and Trump or whoever is in power uh, and be, are able to talk to each other. It is, it is a fiscal stimulus that is directly in the consumer's pockets, uh, whether it's in the form of, of actual kind of cash out refis or whether it's just in the form of lower payments on a monthly basis. This is part of the reason why consumer confidence is getting so good uh, is because basically Bigel's debt service is, is incredibly it's incredibly accessible and, and actually pretty low, um, but it's only going to get better. Uh, you know, this this their mortgage rates are way too high right now. It had to do with a backlog of mortgages, mortgage applications that came through. They just couldn't process them all. Um, but this this is this is a a, a pretty large ref refi wave that is coming, and we're just at the front edge of it right now. No, that's uh, that's definitely a, I think a useful piece of information that Scott. I know we've mentioned it in previous quarters, but something that continues to gain steam. I think the last piece maybe that we'll touch on with the consumer is just this idea of the, the job market. And I think we've talked in the past of just how long it took the job market to recover following previous recessions. Typically that's measured in years, whereas in, in 2020, that seems to be measured in months. Is that, uh, I mean, tell us, tell us what we're looking at here and, and let's kind of walk through that. Yeah, again, there's, there's another sort of measure of, of confidence. I mean, we like this, you know, we like looking at the data this way, some of it because it gets at people's psyche. Um, you know, do people think that jobs are plentiful or do they think that jobs are hard to get? That's that's going to impact the way you behave as a consumer. Um, and, and Austin, like you said, you know, like typically uh, following a recession, people think that jobs are hard to get for a really long time. They certainly don't think, think jobs are plentiful for a really long time. Usually measured, like you said, measured in the magnitude, uh, like in the order of years, not 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 weeks, months and quarters. 
Um, and we saw it after the 2000 recession. We saw it after the great financial crisis. You can go take this chart back further. And it's like, it's a pretty consistent set of behavior that, that people think that, it, you know, like following recession, it takes a little while to get your psyche back. It gets a little while to get your mojo back and feel like you got a good shot. You know, the jobs are out there for, to, to be had. Um, and, and right now that, you know, that's that the, the jobs to hard, the jobs hard to get number um, is, is, is collapsed and it's, and it's back down towards levels uh, that we saw coming into the crisis. So, you know, pe people are feeling, you know, they're feeling pretty good about their, their personal balance sheets. They're feeling okay, at least about, about the labor market. Uh, and, and they're feeling incredible in, in the labor market relative to the fact that we just entered this recession a, a couple, a few months ago. Um, you know, this is not like this thing has been going on for a long time. Uh, people are, are acting and behaving and thinking this is a very resilient uh, sort of metric that we're looking at right now. So Scott, we've talked a lot about kind of the, the confidence of the consumer. I think the one thing I know that we've talked to a number of advisors about in, in terms of confidence is, is maybe this idea of maybe overconfidence in, in regards to kind of this, this, this tech trade that, that appears to be or seems to be on in the marketplace. And I think uh, this slide right here comes from Bank of America Merrill Lynch. It's their global fund manager survey. They put out every month what they call the most crowded trade. And, and obviously the uh, U.S. tech uh, trade is, is the most crowded trade and, and has been for quite some time. And, and historically, you can look at it and it's, it's really pushing the, the bounds in terms of you know, how crowded uh, a crowded trade can be. Um, Scott, anything you would say to this slide? I know we've got a, a following slide that maybe says why that's the way it is. But anything else that, that you would add from a context perspective? Yeah, just the the the, um, the the crowdedness of of the crowd of the crowded trade is kind of crazy. I mean, like you look at the the magnitude of the red line. It's 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 it is you know everybody everybody agrees that long U.S. tech is the most crowded trade. Like the crowdedness of that opinion is 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 uh, <laughs> historical highs as well. So there's a lot of consensus on on that right now. Um, but we do think there's a reason for it. As, you know, as the, as the next chart's going to going to show you, um, you know, everybody wants to compare this period to 2000. Uh, everybody wants to compare this to to dot com bubble when and 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 the eventual uh, burst. And so everybody's kind of looking for the thing that the, you know the what is the needle that's going to prick the balloon, um, and 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 lead to the Nasdaq getting clobbered and and the, the demise of, of mega cap tech. And I, I I would say that they're, they're probably looking for a needle that doesn't exist, uh, because if you think about the if, if this is you know what this chart is showing is the the, the just the number of stocks that can actually generate top line growth that's that's aggressively you know that's that's, that's really good. Uh, we're defining that as greater than 15%. Um, the number of stocks that, that can meet that criteria, that can grow top line at a, at a really aggressive rate, there's just not many of them anymore. Um, and and, it's, and it, this is not, you know, it's not at all like the 2000s when there were, and there, there were a lot of those, there were a lot of those types of stocks. Um, now it's just, it's just not many. And a lot of them are concentrated in the, in the telecom and, and in the, or in the communication services and in the, in the, in the tech space. So what you're paying for, if you're, if you're buying, if you're buying stocks in those, in, in those sectors, you're paying for the ability to grow top line that not many other companies in the United States have the ability to do right now, or at least have not shown the ability to do recently. Um, and that, you know, so that, that is a scarce resource that you're buying. And where scarcity, you know, where there's scarcity, there is value. Uh, and where there's scarcity, there, there is premium. And so, you know, the reason why we're getting, part, you know, one of the reasons why we're getting the increase in the, in the PE or increase in valuations in tech and communication services relative to the rest of the market um, is because of the scarcity uh, that, 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 that those securities uh, actually provide. Um, and so, you know, the, you know when, you're, when you were buying NASDAQ in 2000, you were buying a whole lot of firms that didn't make money. I mean, I was trading, I was trading ball back then. Like, uh, and tech was one of my sectors. Like that was, you know, like it was a little bit of a scary time to be trading that stuff because you knew that there was, there was, you know, this thing was built on, on a lot of air, uh, but it was working. And so you sort of wrote, wrote it while you could. Um, but, there was, there was, you were buying a lot of, you know, you were forced to buy a lot of stocks that didn't make any money. Um, and NASDAQ today, like the, the, the biggest companies in, in NASDAQ are the biggest companies in the world. Um, and they make the most money. Like Google, Facebook, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, uh, you know, like all these, these are the, 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 these are the stocks that make the most money. Um, and so, you know, you're buying, yes, they, they are expensive uh, on a, on a kind of a trailing looking basis. But they're also the, the only stocks in the world that are that are growing top line at a, at a pretty aggressive clip. Uh, so it's you know this is just you know the big big point takeaway here is you know this is just not your 2000 tech bubble bubble. It's a really really different and importantly different dynamics associated with it. No, that's that's a great point, Scott, and I think that's something that that we've had conversations about with a, with a number of folks 
um, in regards to kind of the growth and, and value tilt that you're, you're seeing. I think even today, uh, the S&P 500 is more tilted towards growth than we've seen in, in decades. So I think that speaks to exactly kind of what you're, you're getting at. Um, the last piece I think that, that we'll hit on before we, we take a couple questions um, is just to talk about COVID-19 and, and really where we stand from a, an economic activity standpoint. I know we've talked uh, in previous quarters as to, to where we sit in terms of getting back to normal. And I think obviously what a lot of folks have been watching has been uh, where do we stand from a vaccine standpoint? You know, where, where is that progress? I think um, there were conversations earlier this year that hopefully you would have a vaccine uh, by the end of the year. I'm not saying that that's not going to happen, um, but obviously what you see with the, the data at the top that looks at you know how many vaccines are in different phases of FDA approval. And, and what you'll note is that there's a boatload of really smart minds and, and companies working on uh, this vaccine, but unfortunately we, we don't have one yet today. Um, but I think probably the more telling data set for around the vaccine is the, the charts across the bottom of the page. And that's some survey data from the Pew Research Center that would tell us that uh, while in May, if there had been a vaccine available, roughly 80% of the U.S. adult population uh, probably would have, would have gotten that vaccine. Uh, fast forward four months, uh, the September reading of really the same survey we're going to be, you know, lucky to to get past 50% in terms of the willingness of the the U.S. adult population to really get that vaccine uh, if available. Uh, which then begs the question, and, and something that we've talked about internally. Okay, so what should we be watching in return in regards to um, the 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 vaccine or the the virus itself, and what allows us to get back to normal? And that's where. We've shifted a little bit in terms of what we're watching, not just vaccine progress, obviously still keeping an eye on that because that is important, but also looking at testing uh, and specifically following kind of the rapid testing component. I mean, this data here is a chart from Johns Hopkins, really shows us that we've finally gotten to the point in the U.S. where you're seeing uh, daily tests pretty consistently um, over the last uh, couple weeks now. Uh, you're getting over a million tests a day. Uh, but the rapid testing piece is something that, that we think is pretty important um, in regards to a, a test that would allow uh, results to be known in two to three minutes as opposed to two to three days. Um, and again, something that we feel, and, and we, I know, Scott, we talked about this, I think, last quarter, maybe even the quarter before, this idea of, of plateauing economic activity. Uh, we were plateauing at 75 to 80 percent of, of pre-COVID levels from an economic activity standpoint. And I think we would make the case that, that the testing component is pretty critical uh, to allow us to kind of get over that hump to get maybe back to those pre-COVID levels uh, from an economic activity standpoint. Is that, uh, is, would you agree with that? Yeah, I think that's fair. And, and you know, because really the thing, look, from a market, from a market standpoint, the thing that we care about um, on, on, on the COVID side is the avoidance of, of wide scale shutdowns. So the, 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 you know, to the extent that we can avoid um, going back into April, so the, to the extent we can avoid going back into the place where, uh, where everything is kind of forcibly shut down, that's the thing the market's worried about. And so anything, any advancements we're, we make on the, whether it's the testing side and making the tests faster and better and more of them, whether it's the treatment side, you know, if we have treatment drugs that, that at least make this a, you know, a less troublesome disease or, or speeds the recovery time, or if we get a vaccine or something like that, um, you know, any any sort of set of progress that we have on a, a, from both the testing and the pharmacological side is gonna is gonna lessen is gonna reduce the probability that you enter wide scale lockdowns again, and that's what matters. Uh, and so the, you know the market the market is certainly trading somewhat off that. It's gotten some comfort that we don't believe that we're going back there again because we know a lot more about this disease now than we did in April. Um, and, and 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 so that you know and, and there is a a fairly wide consensus, consensus in the country to, to try to remain open and to open further uh, because of the damage that, that is done not only um, to, uh, to, to to businesses, but frankly, to people's mental health as well. And so, you know, mental health is part of public health um, and there, there's a growing appreciation for that. We believe that, that uh, we think is probably pretty healthy, but but the testing the testing procedures and the, and the treatment advancements that, we've, that have been made and that will be continue to be made over the, over the coming months uh, are going to be really key in, in, in avoiding that shutdown scenario again. 
No, that's a great point, Scott, and and really uh, appreciate you taking the time to walk through. Uh, you know, this kind of brings us to the end of the the prepared slides. Uh, a couple questions, uh, Scott, that have come in kind of while we're talking. One, uh, when we were talking about interest rates and and the fact that rates probably weren't going to rise for three, four, five years. Um, I, I think the question that came over was. Is that more of uh, the Fed, um, you know, choosing not to do that um, from a an economic activity standpoint, or or are they also choosing not to do that because of the debt service levels that they're going to be facing in the coming years? Uh, I mean, like debt debt service matters is, is, is probably some part of the calculation, um, but the, the, the by far the large part of the calculation is. Their, uh, their desperation to avoid the Japanese and Western European outcome of uh, embedded deflation expectations. Um, because what happens if you, if, like you know, in those economies, especially Japan, we've, we've seen it, uh, when you get sort of embedded in disinflation or deflation expectations, what basically when nobody believes that you're gonna see inflation again, the policy tools of the central bank are rendered weak or useless. And that's the, that is the scariest place to be if you're a central banker is to have that have tools that don't work, um, and and so the, you know, the Fed has seen what what can happen if you get deflation expectations built in, um, and 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 you know in their back pocket they believe they know exactly how to crush inflation if they were to get it, so they're not really too worried about runaway inflation because they've got the tools they believe they have the tools to to, to deal with that, but they don't have the tools to deal with or that no central bank in, in the developed world has ever figured out the tools to deal with is is how to fight deflation. Uh, how to fight disinflation and so they are going to do like literally anything including three trillion dollars of liquidity in three months like we just saw they're going to do anything they can do uh to get uh to, to avoid that, that that outcome the japanese and western european outcome of, of sort of um the expectations of deflation coming into the system uh and so you know that um, the, you know, the debt service thing may, may be there somewhere but i can guarantee and told you it is secondary uh to the to the desire to avoid any chance of a deflationary kind of outcome uh, emanating from this demand side hit. Yeah, and, and Scott, one question that that has come in that kind of dovetails off of that is the fact that obviously in in talking today, there's maybe a case to be made for uh, pretty strong, you know, robust growth kind of post vaccine uh, or or post COVID, if you will. Uh, we've also made the case for historically low interest rates, and and historically the combination of those two has been a recipe for inflation. Um, at, at what point, I think the question is, at what point does the investor really start to worry about inflation? Is that something that's, you know, so far down the road that, you know, that's, that's not even in the picture? I mean, you, I know you talked about staying out of the black hole that is deflation, but at what point does inflation really start to re-enter the picture? I believe it when you see it. Um, <laughs> the, 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 every call for inflation over the last 20 years has been wrong. Because the, because the methodology and the backdrop that people have used to understand what drives inflation has been wrong. People don't understand what drives inflation today. The Fed doesn't understand what drives inflation today. That's why they've been wrong for a decade. That's why they changed the way they define inflation. Like that, that's how desperate they got. I mean, think about that for a second. The Fed, whose mandate is inflation and employment, doesn't understand one of those two things and just changed the way they define it. That probably tells you everything you need, you need to know about armchair quarterbacks. They're going to tell you that inflation is coming around the corner. They don't have any idea what they're talking about. The smartest guys in the room don't know what they're talking about. So, like, like in the inflation question, I'll believe it when I see it, because there are some very strong forces at play right now that have been, that have driven inflation low and will continue to put downward pressure on inflation. And most of them have to do with technology and 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 uh, and and, 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 reg and regulatory policies, but. Even if I don't understand what, what what's driving it, even if I don't really get it, uh, like it's not necessary for me to get it. Like I will, like we, we'll react when we see it, um, because you know you shouldn't be, you shouldn't really have much of an allocation to bonds here anyway. So if you don't have an allocation to bonds here with with rates at zero, like I don't know why anybody have an allocation to bonds right now. But if but if you do have an allocation to bonds, um, you know then then maybe you have to worry about it in advance. But if you if you don't have much of an allocation to bonds, because why would you? Um, then like believe it when you see it and, and react accordingly. But trying to predict it. Has been a fool's errand for two decades, um, so I'm just—it's just not a game that we're going to play right now because nobody—nobody nobody understands the fundamental drivers of inflation. That's been very obvious. 
Well, and Scott, I know we've talked internally that uh, I think the Fed would welcome inflation because they feel like they have the tools to to combat inflation. Whereas, like you said, they're they're scared uh, senseless when it comes to deflation because they they won't they don't know how to get out of that black hole. Is that fair? Yep, that's it. I mean, just, like we, we they 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 know how to solve one side of the equation, and and they're trying to get to the place where they have the tools to solve it. Um, but but uh, and, you know, and they're, they'll 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 try anything to avoid the deflationary outcome right now. Yep. Uh, so kind of hand in hand with the the idea of of printing money and and uh, stimulus. Uh, there's a question. You know, what about the continued devaluation of the dollar? Uh, is that something that is is worrisome in the foreseeable future? Well, I mean, I guess I would I would I would I would start with with asking like what what devaluation? Um, you know, the the dollar hasn't really gone anywhere um, for uh, five years, ten years. I mean, it's been it's been it's been a while since the dollar's really really gone anywhere. Um, and and so you know the the the, the dollar uh, you know the, the the dollar is going to do what the dollar is going to do. We don't think it's a, it's going to be massive movements one way or the other. Um, we're not worried about uh, about a devaluation of it because we're printing money, but everybody else is printing money too, um, and 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 we are the reserve currency, and uh, the reserve that that fact right there is a really important one that nobody quite again nobody quite understands how important it is or, or really what it ends up meaning at the end of the day. But the fact that we're the, that we're the reserve currency like matters a lot to the analysis. We're not Zimbabwe. This is not this is not a, a Weimar Republic kind of thing, um, and so the the, the you know the the, the dollar is going to fluctuate around, but it's you know it's, it's like people have been calling for the demise of the dollar, including some very uh, well-known people, um, for I don't know 20 years again, 10 years, and certainly since since people since QE started, people have been calling for the demise of the dollar, and the dollar is stronger today than when they started QE um, by a lot, and the dollar is like the dollar has gone nowhere since 2015. It's not it's, it is what is it? It's a, about a percent weaker on the year, I guess, uh, but but it's it is a uh, you know, the, the, the dollar, dollar strength is not seen. We're actually, I'd be more, more worried about dollar strength and dollar weakness. Dollar strength would mean that things are starting to go go haywire again. Um, so dollar weakness yep. actually be a little bit of a boon to global economies. Uh, last question, Scott, that, that's come over, and I know we've talked a little bit about this. We talked about growth stocks being uh, kind of that most crowded trade. Is there anything that we're watching for that would signal a growth value rotation um, out, of, out of the growth stocks? Uh, into value stocks or anything that kind of pops that growth bubble uh, in, in our mind. You know, like we 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 might be looking for a growth a growth rotation into into something like small caps, but 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 to to get into value kind of writ large or just sort of passive value exposure in the United States means you have to like financials. Financials are the largest sector in value, and and, and with rates going nowhere and with regulation likely to go up on on the financial sector, especially in the blue wave scenario, regulation is going way up on the financial sector. Um, that's not a that's not a sector that we that we really like a lot right now. Can't don't see a lot of value there, um, and so that, you know we, we we could see a little bit more uh, you know more of a case for rotating into, into small caps um, to, to benefit from fiscal expansion and, and benefit from a from a, fa a sharper than expected turnaround in the economy. Um, but but just going kind of blindly into into value uh, would be a tough one because just to, to like value you have to like financials and and we just don't right now. Yep. No, Scott, really appreciate the time and, and appreciate everybody sticking with us uh, today. Obviously, we've covered a lot of material. Uh, hopefully, it's been helpful. One last thing I will leave you with for, for folks on today's call, um, just kind of, a, a uh, I would say, a, an appetizer, a, a teaser of sorts, uh, kind of what's coming next. And this is something that I, I would say some of you and, and actually many of you have probably seen uh, maybe early versions of some of our new tech tools uh, this is something that is rolling out uh, as we speak. So this quarter, uh, you will get access, uh, hopefully within the next couple of weeks, you will get access to the uh, the new tech tools that are available for all of our Horizon One clients that involves really that customized model solution set uh, in a planning proposal framework. So uh, be on the lookout for that. Really excited to roll that out. Um, to make that available to everyone so that you can start to interact with many of the tools uh, that we have within a customized framework. Um, so, like I said, be on the lookout for that. Uh, that will probably be introduced um, sometime in the in the next couple weeks, either as part of a quarterly meeting or as a standalone uh, call for sure. Um, so, watch for that. 
really excited for, for folks to have that at their fingertips. Uh, but again, really appreciate everybody taking the time this afternoon uh, to join us and really look forward to connecting with everybody as part of quarterly meetings that are coming up here in the next couple of weeks. Uh, as always, don't hesitate to reach out if there are questions in the meantime, if there's any follow-up uh, that needs to be after this call in regards to, to ideas or, or thoughts that come up, happy to, uh, to address those. Um, and obviously, everybody knows how to get in touch uh, with us here. Um, so with that being said, we will uh, we'll end today's call. But like I said, really look forward to catching up here soon with everybody on the phone. Thanks so much.